Okay. Well, let's just get into it. Yeah. Sydney, welcome to the Easy Spotlight podcast. Today, I am joined by licensed therapist and owner of Made for This Counseling, Sydney Kunz. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Cool. I appreciate you jumping on. Today, I kind of want to go in a, a lot of different directions, kind of understanding your journey into the space of therapy, you know, you deciding to start your own thing understanding who is kind of right for therapy because especially from maybe a male perspective or just a perspective of you know being a young person growing up or culturally maybe some there's some things attached to therapy that people don't understand so it'd be great to sure. to get your perspective on that but firstly just be great to get an introduction of who are you or how did you land and decide that you wanted to do therapy in the first place I'm yeah, counselor. for sure. Um, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I was growing up. <laughs> um, I was undecided um, with my major in college till like the end of sophomore year. I knew I always kind of wanted to go into the helping profession. Um, but I was really, you know, my whole life, I was an athlete for the longest time. And so I thought, you know, maybe athletic training, kind of going in there. I took an intro class to that, didn't really vibe with it. Um, and so then, you know, I had taken a psychology class in high school. And so I took that as an elective again in college and I just was really drawn to it. Um, and then, you know, my freshman year, it was really difficult. You know, I was 14 hours away from home. Um, learning to live on my own, athletics, um, things were going on at home too. And so I just reached out to the, um, the counseling center at Queens and um, started therapy on my own. Um, and that was really helpful during that time. Um, and so then with the help of like advisors encouraging me and things like that, I was like, this is something I really want to provide for other people. And something I kind of want to go into. And so that is kind of how that all happened. Um, yeah. A lot of people will go through that. I, I definitely have. And I think it's, I think you're lucky if you are able to get yourself in a place where you say, I think I like this. Because mm -hmm. too many people go through university and even at the end of it be like, I have no idea what I want to do. You know, I still, I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure, figure that out. And especially when, you know, the people don't know, we both went to the same university, both played sports, mm -hmm. you played volleyball. Um, yep. And that's a big part of your focus. That's taken up a lot of your time. You're wrapped up in a world in which, you know, you, your schedule set, a lot's yep. going on. And sometimes you don't have the space. So you mentioned counselor, you meant, mentioned advisors. What do you think got you to the place where you were like, I am, this is, this is the path, you know, do you think, was it an advisor? Was it a situation? Was it something internally that said, yes, helping, helping people is aligned with who I am? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think that my own experience in counseling was huge for me because I didn't really see that as an option. I didn't really know what kind of jobs are available for psych degrees. Um, but yeah, my, the psychology department at Queens is amazing. And they really, you know, for me, I was like, also, am I going to be able to get into a master's program? Because that's what you need to be able to do it. And I was very much lacking confidence in myself. Um, but they encouraged me to just do it and that I can do it. And if this is something I'm really interested in, want to do for a career. Um, so they, they really gave me the push I needed to um, hone in on my interest of it. Um, Cause I, yeah, I think it is really stressful to try to pick a major right away at that time. Um, it's, yeah, so that was really helpful. To yeah, have that's that. one of the, the qualms I have with the 
English or European system is that you have to pick before you even you even go to university. Yeah. So like having to do that at 17 years old, it's like, I have no clue. I don't even know <laughs> which way I want to turn on the street yet. I was supposed to decide my whole career. And exactly. so through the help of others, you kind of got there. So just to explain to people the process of you then, you said you have to get a master's degree. I'm assuming you have to get a bunch of hours and mm-hmm. and, and, and go in you know, what is that process and how did you start to kind of find what space? Because there's lots of different spaces within therapy I'm sure you can go into. So how did you start to define that as you went? Yeah. Um, So, yeah, I decided to go back home uh, to Wisconsin um, and get my master's there. Um, I really wanted to go to a school that was K CREP accredited, which basically just means that it's an accredited university that will allow you to kind of be more flexible, like if you wanted to leave the state or if you wanted to, because licensing in different states is different. Um, so if you ever wanted to move, um, having that degree as a, at a K CREP accredited program was huge. So I did that. And then, yeah, you did a certain amount of hours for internship, which was unpaid, just clinical hours. Um, And then I graduated. um, And then you have to do 3000 hours under a supervisor before you can be fully licensed with the state and then apply for state licensure. Um, And so I, yeah, I recently just got licensed in the state of Wisconsin, which was really exciting. I'm done with my hours. and so that feels really good. And so from being, going through that program, instead of jumping in and continuing in a, maybe a corporate setting, or I don't quite know the landscape of how that would work. You mm-hmm. decide, I'm going to set up my own thing, mm. you, you know? And so where did that decision come from? And why why do your own thing? Is it something you learned during those 3,000 hours of what you were seeing or what gave you mm-hmm. gave that motivation? Yeah, so I worked at two different uh, practices while I was gaining my hours. And so the first was we were working with insurance. It was a community kind of mental health practice, um, really not getting paid well. And I, I hate to say that, but it's true. Um, and I was getting really burnt out fast. I was seeing like, eight clients a day. Um, It was really hard work. And so I had this opportunity to go to a group practice, which was, um, I was basically a contractor instead of an an employee. And so there was a bit, a huge pay increase, you know, um, and I could set my own hours. I could decide what clients I wanted to see. It was definitely more flexible. Um, And then you know, kind of some things were happening in that group practice that ethically I didn't really align with. Um, And a few people, the other therapists in that group practice were going off on their own. And so they kind of gave me the push that I can also do that if I really wanted to, if this was not the space for me anymore. Um, And so yeah, I kind of took that leap of faith and I didn't really know you could open your own thing as a in training licensed therapist, but you can, as long as you have a supervisor. Um, and so, yeah, I, I made that transition. Not to go into the past of, of, of what was maybe not aligned with your values, Mm -hmm. but what would you say, are your values that you carry forward into your practice today Mm -hmm. for someone coming to see you? Yeah, I think, well, as therapists, we do have like our code of ethics, which is how to, you know, be doing therapy appropriately with clients. Um, And so just going forward, just doing the basic ethics that we're taught Uh, confidentiality between the therapist and client um, 
And then, you know, as I'm on my own, I can bring in like what I view as really helpful in the therapeutic space. So I take a more holistic approach where it's not just mental health, it's physical and spiritual and it's your whole self. Um, Yeah. And then, yeah, just my values of providing really safe and supportive therapy and using the treatment modalities that I feel like align with me. There's so many out there. Um, But yeah, just being able to do to do that. That's interesting. I didn't know either that you could go and it must be interesting being a young therapist in this space kind of out of your own and and you know coming across different people and and yeah and as you go let's change the direction a little bit from just therapy as a whole and kind of defying the space because if I'm being completely honest when I I I go to therapy just out of you know trying to work on myself but it took me a long time to get to a place Mm -hmm. where I could be like the heck is that why do I need to go to therapy you know I'm looking at myself thinking me there's something wrong with me and and not understanding that that's not it's what it's all about and Mm -hmm. and going on beyond and also this is where like a cultural component will come in whether it's like maybe England I definitely think as I be in America I feel like Americans are way more there's my perception that Americans are, are more vulnerable more open um to conversation and also more open just to like the therapy space in general so how Mm. do you kind of define therapy and if do you think there's a type of person that therapy is for is it or is it just for everybody Mm -hmm. yeah I think I think we have kind of as a society moved away or have tried to move away from that stigma of therapy, that therapy is only for, you know, really severe mental illness. But, um, and I hate using the term illness, but that's just what it was at the time. And, um, but now therapy can be used in so many ways. Um, It can be preventative. Um, It can be a place to, discover yourself, get to know yourself better, get to know how you respond to different circumstances, how you are in relationships, uh, that's friendships, romantic, family members, you know, um, or even just to process some of the experiences that you've been through that, I mean, life is just like, get to the next spot, get to the next spot, and we don't really sometimes talk or even think about how those things have affected us, whether good or bad. And um, yeah, it can be just a place to do those things. It doesn't have to be just, you know, I'm coming in with anxiety and I'm dealing with this or which it's, that's what it's there for too. But um, I think therapy can be for everyone. And I hope that from hearing me say that, that people feel comfortable to, you know, try, try out therapy for themselves. Um, I think another thing too, that is difficult is the first therapist you go to might not, you might not always have the best experience or that might person might not be a good fit. And so it is kind of trial and error in the beginning, which can be discouraging um, and can be like, well, this didn't work. I'm, I'm done trying. But um, it really is finding a therapist that you really align with and work well with. Um, and so that process can kind of be difficult to go through. That was the thing I found uh, surprising. I think when I first was, was, you know, finding a therapist and going through that. One thing I found surprising was... Firstly, just the list of questions you kind of have to go through at the start. I've come to find that that is just standard practice through everything. But it's almost as if like, am I being forced to be diagnosed as something? It was, it was my initial reaction. I was like, mm-hmm. no, I'm, a, I'm okay here. I'm okay here. I'm okay here. And yeah. there was some early, depending on some the therapist I was speaking to about like, you know, are you open to 
are you open to taking a certain drug or something, which is just not aligned with me, but it was surprising to me that we got there so quick in terms of asking. And I know it was more of just like a, maybe a, a question that you, you have to ask, but it was something that surprised me in the process. And you mentioned earlier, like a holistic approach and also knowing that you're an athlete, you know, yeah. you're going to look at things from a lot of different perspectives. So what kind of experiences have you you know, do you take into your practice? Is it from athletics? Is it from just everything? Like, what what do you bring in, or what do you think other people may find surprising beyond beyond that? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think, in general, therapists a lot of the times go into this field because of their own experiences, um, and so. Yeah, athletics was huge. And that's one thing I'm working on is trying to um, network with the surrounding colleges to hopefully get student athletes as clients, um, because I do have that unique perspective of knowing what it's like day in and day out. Um, And then also, you know, as I was... um, starting my own practice, a lot of the marketing strategy is finding your niche. Um, And that was really big for me because I would always say I'm more of a general therapist, anxiety, depression, you know, but um, it really made me figure out who I want to work with and what also experiences that I've had that I can bring that empathetic understanding to on a really deep level. Um, and But that's not always needed to provide good therapy, you know. But um, yeah, I'd say so athletes um, and right now I'm, I'm doing like abusive relationships. I'm trying to market for that. Um, and yeah, anxiety depression, you know. Um, So, yeah, I think my own experiences really can help guide the therapeutic process um, and make it make it unique. Because I think a lot of therapists, like, for example, another therapist, experiences grief a lot of grief and now they're specialized in providing grief therapy and so i think Mm. that's where a lot of therapists try to figure out where their niche is how do you view yourself in in terms of a, a patient's journey like and i think this goes to somebody who's going to therapy and trying to understand where where it is beneficial for them like he are you a partner in their journey? Are you a coach? Like, where, where do you see yourself? Is it role? And does it change between the people that you're seeing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a conversation I try to have openly with each client, like checking in with them, you know, asking them what, what their goals are. How do you want to utilize this space and having open conversations about that? Um, I always say therapists are not advice givers because um, I haven't, I haven't experienced everything in life, right? I don't have like all this wisdom to give all the time, but I know what to encourage or I know maybe where to challenge your thoughts or perspectives um, or what questions to kind of ask for you to get to know yourself better and, and why that is, or why you are the way you are. Um, and so I would say I take a very much supportive and encouraging role. Um, but also incorporating a lot of the things we learn in school, like the treatment modalities, um, and utilizing those within. But I think some people, come to vent and talk about their weeks, which is great. It's healthy. Get that off your chest, you know? Um, And so I'll meet them where they're at. Or if someone wants to dive deeper, I'll meet them there. Um, And so I kind of 
go where the client goes. Um, but always I'm checking in to see, are we doing what you came here to do or do we need to move a different direction? I think there's a, a, a definition there between like a coach and, and the therapist or almost because you, you know, you're saying in the space of like not giving advice and mm -hmm. I myself have kind of experimented between okay. just seeing, I was like, what, what is a, what is a coach? The, the coach is like a buzzword that they're, they're popping up everywhere compared to a, mm -hmm. a therapist. And my kind of experience has been not to say that all coaches are, are not great, but I haven't had the most best experiences mm -hmm. with coaches as opposed to therapists. I think it's per my personal opinion mm -hmm. is that it comes from the level of training and where maybe a coach is based off experience and mm -hmm. kind of antidotal, you know, evidence. You're kind of coming from, you know, 3000 hours, master's <laughs> degree. You're coming through all this of being able to really get to there and which I personally like not to say that's for everybody right. have you seen like a, a trend in in the coaches and, and maybe definition from your side um a lot of my clients actually have done life coaches um and you know I think like you said everyone's different or needs different things and I think it's okay to try both um, but it is very different. I would say I have never experienced a life coach, but, um, I've kind of had to help people who have experienced that shift in a different, like, this is not the same. Um, and so, yeah, it is, yeah, we have different training and there's also, you know, like, I'm a licensed professional counselor and LPC, and then there's social workers and marriage and family therapists, and then there's all these different directions you can go. And so, um, but yeah, I think our training makes it a different space to be in than with a life coach. Kind of touches on your point earlier about you have to kind of go through that initial phase of do, maybe doing a little bit of experimenting in testing and seeing out what works for you who is thing mm -hmm. because all, all areas have their merits and um, it's all about the approach so talk to talk about approach one of the mm -hmm. things reading through you is this strength-based approach what does that mean what is a strength-based approach and, and why use that yeah to help people yeah I think you know a lot of the times we're coming to therapy because either we have it, we're coming with negatives. We're coming with really difficult things we've experienced, maybe really negative self perceptions of ourselves. And so I think it's really important. Yeah, we're gonna talk through that, but also build you up in the process because you've made it to here. And how have you made it to here? Like you are resilient, you are, you know, so I, and a lot of the times it is, I'm working with people with really low self-esteem. And so it's like, but you do have strengths. You have done this and this, you have evidence for doing all these great things. And so I really like the strengths-based approach because um, we got to look at the, the positives too that are happening. And um, so being able to do the work where it's needed, but focus on the progress or the things you're doing really well, because that's important too. And you, I'm, I'm pulling this from one of your pages, but oh. and I just kind of want to go from there. So mm -hmm. ditch people pleasing and low <laughs> self-esteem, find your voice and start living for you. Yeah. Well, what does that mean to you? Why, why is that something that you, you want to highlight and want to focus on? Yeah. Well, that is um, something I personally have had to tell myself too. Um, and that's kind of where I really want my, you know, people going to my page. That's kind of my niche, you know, like people pleasing, low self-esteem, 
codependency, those sorts of things. Um, but I think it really means looking at yourself and your life and what you want to make of it. Um, and to not care what other people's people think and do what feels best for you. Um, and if you don't know that, then we'll explore that. But, um, I really think, especially now with social media, like we're seeing all these things of like, do this or do that. Um, and I just want people to start living for themselves um, and doing what's best for them. I think that's huge in like, a, especially our age group or people going through your, your 20s, once you have distractions of social media, feeling like, maybe what you should be doing too. You may have like, you know, pressures outside of that, you know, work, create, yeah. you need to make money. I, but I, you know, yeah. I want to, I kind of want to follow my passions too. And, yeah. and, and where is that line, you know, for us as, as people trying to figure out what we want to, what, what we want to do with our lives. And, and mm -hmm. so do, do, do you notice trends from conversations you have? Do you have things where you think, okay, because I, that's a big part of the conversations I'm having with these, this easy living is that I think you get kind of squashed down. <laughs> it, it's almost as if you get, you get to university, you, you had all these dreams about what you can be and who you want to be. You go to university, it's a wild time. Every, everything is going on. You've got university, you're meeting people, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Then you go out you're like, I'm in the world now. I'm, I'm, I'm going to make it. <laughs> And then the year after year, say you're working in a corporate environment, that, that dream of brain starts to get squashed and squashed yeah. and squashed. And yeah. so how, how, how would you kind of talk to somebody who's like, yeah, I still, I, I still want to stay close or aligned to who I am. You know, yeah. do you have an insight in where you'd go there? It's so true. I think, I think, everyone struggles with the transition out of college. Like, I think it's really, you're thrown into your full-time job. You feel like you have no time anymore. You're, you just want to go home and lay on the couch and you don't want to do anything. And then the weekend comes and it's like, you're living for the weekend, but then you start the whole thing over again. And you feel like you just have no time to like do anything that you love anymore or, um, even work environments are toxic. And um, so I would say I see that a lot. And I think, um, yeah, I think the transition out of college is really difficult. Um, I think another thing I tell my clients a lot of the time is asking them where they got their information because TikTok is so huge now, um, and there's a lot of information floating around, and not everything you read is true. No, you don't have bipolar, and no, you don't, right? Like, but people are just, like, self-diagnosing. They're wanting to find answers to how they're feeling, but I think that's what I'm kind of seeing now with college students in particular is well if i meet all these things that this tiktok video is showing me then i have adhd and all these things and it's um i'm working a lot with clients on is everything on tiktok true and let's actually talk about what adhd is or let's talk about what this actually is um and so i get it like people want to find answers to how they're feeling but sometimes it's just that it really sucks adulting like it really sucks coming out of college and adulting it doesn't mean you have all these things and so that's like a huge conversation that I feel like I've been having often and that could be like a trend is there a is there a need to kind of understand reality? Do you think is it there's like a, a gap between people's perception of reality and what there is because of social media? Because people are, are living more on more on apps, so they just 
saying this yeah. must be what everyone else is doing I was the other week it's like everyone's doing it but no one that you know it you know it, yeah I feel like that's a social media trend and like you, you you're telling me that everyone is doing this but no one you actually know is doing this so where is that gap where, where is this happening where do you tell them to get information then if, if that's how they're getting uh, it yeah um not tiktok um but uh valid sources um and i tell them to like if you found something bring it in and we'll talk about it um but i think a lot of the times i'm normalizing people's experiences because we are human and we are all trying to get through life together and um a lot of the times it is validating them and saying it does suck right now, but there are things that we could try to do to make it suck less um, and to make you feel better. And, um, and so that's kind of where I direct the conversation. Um, but yeah, check your, check your sources, everyone. <laughs> that's something I didn't think would come, but it's also something like I'd, I probably hear in the media like people are uh, captured by whatever a headline is but not yeah. actually think about how that is affecting people especially in in college you have TikTok I don't think TikTok I think TikTok came after we graduated yeah. so maybe yeah. we got lucky we got <laughs> lucky there yeah. but to go on to that is trying to normalize it for clients and patients to, to get a little personal and you and yourself and you know yeah. being a young therapist and newly licensed and you got your own thing and you know does it weigh on you having all of these having like deep conversations all day every day trying to figure out my own business trying to figure out your reality it, you know is that a challenge that, oh, that you go through yes and yes. how do you how do you t manage that how how do you navigate that um, well, I feel like it's calmed down a little bit now. I've been almost open a year now. Um, but in the beginning, it was a lot to learn and figure out. Like, I, I didn't go to school for business. I don't know how to run a business. Um, and so it was really, once I figured all that out, then it was like, okay, I can focus my attention on like the work again, but it is balancing being a business owner and a therapist all in one. And yeah, the, the work is tough a lot of the times. And so I always have to check in with myself on and really make sure I know how to recharge my battery and what helps me decompress after a long day or, um, those sorts of things, which they tell you that in school, right? Like they t make you really aware of preventing burnout and how to take care of yourself while doing this work. Um, and so, but doing it while opening a business was quite challenging, um, but well worth it in the end. What were some of the distinctions in you putting on your business person hat compared to your therapist hat were there were there things that battle each other or were they just different things that you you had to do and mm. had to grow in um probably price <laughs> um i want to make therapy you know i don't accept insurance and maybe that's something i'll do in the future but i don't for now because I'm one person and insurance companies are like a whole nother ball game. Um, and I just don't have the time to be like submitting all these claims and doing that. And so maybe in the future, if I can hire someone to do that for me, but for now I'm out of pocket. And so setting a price for me was really difficult because I want to make it affordable, but I, it's also my time and energy. And the basis of being a therapist is helping people. And so it's just, that was a huge 
inner battle for me was figuring out price. Um, but I really had to check my own boundaries with clients and not get too lenient or, you know, I offer some sliding scale rates, but I can't offer that to everyone. Um, and that was really, that, that's still like a a current struggle. Um, but I have partnered with this company called Mentaya, um, and they do all of like, they will submit all the claims to your insurance company um, for out of network mental health uh, therapy. So that's really great. I've been trying to find other ways to help my clients get money back and like not have it be such an, uh, an expense. Um, Cause I know what it's like when expenses add up and, I, but I also know the value of like going to therapy and some people want to come weekly and it's just, so that, um, was a, was a struggle for sure. This is such a honest point to share and something that I think people either, I know people outside America will not understand. And I think even people in America don't mm-hmm. even fully understand how insurance works, how yes. it's tied to your benefits and, and your mm-hmm. employer and how to get the most out of it. Like mm-hmm. I myself in the last year, not from a therapy perspective, but from like an injury perspective, went through last year where I was, didn't really fully understand the system. I was like, okay, let me think. And then it was like, okay, you've got to hit a deductible. And then once your deductible is hit, then you're covered. And then, but you're not covered by everybody. And then this year, because I knew Mm -hmm. I had things going on, I was like, okay, let's increase my insurance because I know what I want to use it for. Mm -hmm. And then you hit your deductible, then you're covered. But I think it's an, a note to anyone, regardless of whether you want therapy, whether you got anything, understanding how <laughs> your insurance works mm-hmm. will make a huge difference to how yeah. you can not let the system use you, for sure. essentially. And I can imagine for you, that is a huge thing because people are going to have lots of different perceptions of the value of therapy, right? Sure. Especially a first time user of therapy and not having it, they're going to be like, am I really spending this much money on a conversation Mm -hmm. that I may have to have every week? Mm -hmm. And I I can only imagine how hard that gap is to bridge right at the start. I know. Uh, A part of me sometimes is like, well, you know, you're paying to go, you know, get a massage or get your nails done or, Mm -hmm. you know, do all these things. And I think too, it's like, if therapy is a true priority for you, a lot of people will make it happen and Mm. make it work. Um, But the other thing I don't like about insurance is that you have to put a diagnosis down. (laughs) Um, And that I really didn't like doing that um, Mm. because not everyone has a diagnosis. And then that's on your record. Um, And so not that, you know, it being on your record really matters or things like that, but it's a label. And I just, it doesn't sit right with me to be throwing out all these diagnoses to people um, who don't have it. Um, and so that's the one thing I don't also why I don't accept insurance at this point too, is just, it doesn't align with me and the the work I want to be doing. That's a great point. It kind of goes back to the thing that surprised me when I was first entering it and like having all these questions asked, having all these like, are you open to taking a drug for this? Or, or you have, okay, you know, you don't have depression. I was like, I kind of feel like I don't, but now that you're throwing all these words around, it's like almost creating a confusing world because they're forcing you, forcing you, but you're having to go through these hoops for insurance purposes, Mm -hmm. which is, that is not fun. (laughs) No. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Sometimes, you know, diagnoses can be really helpful for Mm -hmm. a lot of different reasons. Um, but then other times they're just not, and they're just labels that we don't need. 
Um, Cause you could be nervous and feel anxious, but that doesn't mean you have a clinical diagnosis of like an anxiety disorder. So that's also another conversation I have with clients a lot of the time is whether it's clinically significant or not. We're going to perspective and, and the value of therapy, because I think that's something that's super useful for everybody to understand, regardless if, it, if it's therapy or anything, like until you've, it almost needs to be a kind of curious mind until mm -hmm. the point of, let me at least try it. Let me give three sessions to this or give three sessions to mm -hmm. getting a massage because I've, I've seen the example done in a different scenario. This is this example is not going to relate, but this okay. is kind of a, a, a my world <laughs> yeah, yeah. example. But it's like golf. I love playing golf. Golf yes. is an expensive sport. Mm -hmm. And so as you when you first started out playing golf, it's hard to rationalize to yourself that I'm going to pay 50 to 100 dollars right now to hit a white ball around a golf course for four mm -hmm. hours. Mm -hmm. And you're like, God, how can I do this in the cheapest way possible? Yeah. I'm never going to be able to play this sport. And then maybe you you play it once or twice and you you find some value. Like, I actually really like this. I love being outdoors for four hours. I love the social mm -hmm. connection. And you start to maybe leave some room in your budget for it. Mm -hmm. And then as that kind of grows and continues, maybe that budget even goes up. That's the case that's happened for me. Elena yeah. might not be happy to to hear <laughs> that, but my goal budget continues to increase because there's little things as I one as I get better and I find more value in it is mm. that that space. Oh, I, I like a nicer course this mm -hmm. one, so I'm going to pay more for that. And that kind of same, just having a perspective whether it's going into therapy is like finding that value in it and understanding this is worth my money. This is worth my time, regardless of just that framework, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would usually tell people, um, try at least, like you said, five sessions, because I think it is a, a new environment. It's nerve wracking. You're like word vomiting for the first session. And I always tell clients, like, this is just how it's going to be the first session, just because I need to get to know you and I need to know your background and history. But from here on out, like, we're going to work on building this therapeutic relationship. And that takes time. Like, you're not going to be comfortable with someone right away. Um, and so it is kind of like practice. You have to kind of go into it each time with an open mind. Um, and then hopefully that that builds over time. But I would say my, for myself, it's it's not been until the third session of anything that anything starts to make sense. I definitely, regardless of who it is, I work out the first one and two like, hmm, that was probably a waste of money. Just just because all I did was talk. I think word vomit is the perfect thing. You're trying to say so much in yeah. a condensed amount of time. And yeah. even the second session, you, you may have realized that you did that and you're like, okay, let me try and fix that. And it's not until, okay, the third is like, okay, here's a narrative forming now. Now I can yeah. kind of chill out. <laughs> let, let's focus on something and yeah. figure out how it can be better. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Sydney, I appreciate you coming on today and, and sharing kind of your journey and w what you do, how you do it, your approach. Mm -hmm. You Are you... Is it all in person? I'm, I'm pretty sure I saw some of it's virtual. Can can people see you at Maple Counseling virtually, regardless of where they are? How does that work? Um, yeah, so I have an office in Milwaukee that I do in person. I can do virtual for anyone in the state of Wisconsin, so wherever that is. Um, so, yeah, right now I'm only licensed in Wisconsin. Um, they've kind of been passing um some new laws so hopefully i can get licensed in other states um while being in wisconsin but for now yeah just wisconsin but i really appreciate uh this conversation we had today um and i hope people have some good takeaways i appreciate you and i'll put the links anyway because i think even on your social media and your instagram you're sharing things that are for everybody you're sharing methodologies perspective different ways of thinking 
about things that anyone can use regardless of where they are. And I think a takeaway yeah. is that it doesn't have to be you who is a therapist, but you can try it. You can try different size of coaching. You can get a feel mm -hmm. for it and, you know, always grow and progress. So I really appreciate you having, having this conversation. Thanks.